So now we're going to take a look at just different sort of events that could happen that, that's going to impact our reliability. And there's a lot of different things we could be looking at here. Um, we're going to be kind of focusing more on looking at overhead lines and overhead equipment because that's where most of the action's at. Just talk briefly about underground, but there could be issues with any item out in the field like circuit breakers or surge arresters, insulation, et cetera. But I have to say that primarily you're going to have reliability issues with, with feeders, overhead and underground. So when we're talking about overhead, there's just a lot of exposure here because this is just out in the open. It's not covered or anything. And so as far as things we have to be concerned about, you've got obviously trees. Uh, you could talk about other vegetation like vines. Uh, lightning would be another issue. You can have animal contact. We can have people running into poles. So you can have traffic accidents. And if we're talking about underground, we could have um, say construction personnel actually dig into cables. So a lot of things could be happening here. Um, as, as far as events associated with trees, a lot of times where we're going to have issues is let's say if I had a pole, and this is especially true of storms, is you're worried about trees that if they were going to fall would fall into your wires and perhaps push wires together causing like a line to line fall or a three phase fall or knock wires on the ground and causing a line to ground fall and so not only are you worried about branches getting into the overhead but you're also worried about well maybe if the wind's high enough it could actually cause the tree to snap and fall into the line and so when, when utility personnel talk about danger trees, they're talking about trees that might not be contacting the wires, but if they were going to topple, would actually get tangled up in the lines. Uh, the other thing that trees do is they make it easier for animals to get onto overhead. And so they can kind of indirectly cause issues with that. Um, and then if you just had trees actually growing into the wires, they could actually push the wires together, which is why we do tree trimming, right? And so you, you see utilities usually go out and do kind of extensive trimming every so often, like every two to four years to keep the, to keep the branches out of the, the lines. Now you can have some issues due to tree branch contact and um, people a lot of times think that, you know, if you have overhead and if you have like a tree and a branch contacts the wire that this is really what causes a fault to occur actually this path right here is pretty high impedance and so again it's usually more um, involving a, a branch falling into the wires as opposed to just like a what seems like might be a path to ground but what happens a lot of times due to storm conditions, you'll have overhead. So you have like your three phases and what will happen is a branch will break or get blown into a wire. And what happens is the branch makes a contact between two hot phase conductors. And so what's really going on in this case? Well, um, one thing these branches usually have some moisture associated with it. And so if you get a little bit of current flowing in here due to the contact with the overhead, you can actually dry out the branch and that would actually make the resistance go up, right? You actually make the fault current go away. However, what could happen because there's a, a electric field, there's a high potential across that branch. It could actually cause the, the cellulose to carbonize. And if it carbonizes, that produces a low impedance branch. So depending on whether the branch dries out faster than it carbonizes, that'll tell you or not whether we're gonna get a fault due to something like this. And if it turned out this would carbonize and form a very low impedance path, well, you'd, you'd have I squared R losses that are so high, it almost looks like that branch erupts in flames and a lot of times it ends up falling on the ground and burning and that's when the fire department gets called out. Um, but generally, again, we don't worry about the single branch from the tree touching the line. It's more when the branch breaks and 
causes like a phase to phase sort of a connection. Uh, lightning is another issue. And if I had like an overhead, say have like overhead wire, and they say this is my three phases, uh, what can happen is lightning can either strike the wire or can get pretty close to it where it induces energy into it. And it turns out that these overhead wires have a, what we call a transit impedance um, on like order of like hundreds of ohms, like a typical value might be like 300 amps. And so given that lightning looks like a high current source in this example, I use like five kiliampers as a number. What happens is the fact we're injecting a current and then it's propagating through a high impedance, what this is gonna do, and this is actually ohms right here. I don't know why I put the A, but 300 ohms. What happens is that you take this impedance times the current and you get a really high value of voltage, maybe in this case as high as 1.2 megavolts. And that high voltage is going to be higher than the insulation withstand capability, what we refer to sometimes as a BIL rating, basic um, um, insulation level. And so if that's the case and what can happen is we can actually get like a flashover like between two adjacent phases or you get a flashover between a phase and ground and that causes a short circuit. Now, in the case of lightning, if, if I have an upstream breaker, if I can de-energize that line, a lot of times that line is gonna be cleared where we can actually close back it again. This might actually be a temporary fault. Um, but again, it kind of depends on the event. So lightning would be something else that overhead susceptible to. And we can actually, have a rough idea about how many lightning events we're going to have per year from what's called an isochronic map. So depending where you are in the United States, you'll have different levels of lightning. You'll see on the West Coast, the levels are pretty low, less than 10 thunderstorm days per year. Or if you're like in central Florida, you might have like 100 lightning days per year, 100 thunderstorm days per year. And so your incidence of lightning to strike actually is, is a function of location. Uh, another sort of thing we see is we see issues with animal contact. So this shows an animal guard. This is actually something you put around a bushing on a transformer because then animals have this tendency to, to, to get on top of these um, transformers and what can happen if they make a contact between the top of the transformer, which is grounded to this hot wire then that'll actually create a fault through the, through the animal. And so what we can do is we can actually put different guards out there that protect certain sensitive um, places, you know, keep animals from causing faults. Uh, birds could actually cause faults as well, you know, on cross arms, uh, birds get up into the wires. Um, and so there'll be different sort of guards and things we can do to mitigate against this. Now for underground cables, um, we talked a little bit about cables before and, and the fact we have different sort of plastics that we use for the insulation. The issue we run into is that if we have voltage on these cables, medium voltage, what this is doing is this is stressing this insulation. And what can happen is we can get moisture into these cables and the combination with the moisture with the electric field is, is actually gonna cause a, a slow degradation of this insulation. Um, what this moisture results in is it results in what's called tree. And so basically you're gonna see these little tree structures um, start to break down the insulation and if these tree structures progress to, at, to a certain point, what's gonna happen is that the insulator is going to fail and where it's going to fail as a short circuit. Um, we could use surge arresters to kind of keep things like lightning from stressing this insulation out further. And if it turns out we have like a weak spot in a cable, what we can actually do is we can actually cut it out and we can splice back in a good section of cable. And that's how we can usually keep cable operating. But at a certain point, it's kind of hard to kind of keep doing that anymore. And so let me go ahead and get my uh, 
picture back in here. So what we may have to do is we may, um, you know, have to replace cable after a while. Um, if it just, you know, becomes too much of a maintenance burden, keep splicing it over and over because the thing you run into a splicing is actually causes a weak spot where if you had like thermal heating, you can actually cause those splices to fail. Um, one thing about cable is that the insulation loses strength over time. And this is shown on the log scale here on the horizontal axis where this is log in years. And eventually a, a cable is going to fail. When a cable has been in service for a certain period of time, the insulation just keeps degrading annually to the point where the cable just has to be replaced. And the question is, is it going to be like 10 years, which is kind of short, versus like 100 years or maybe 50 years uh, for a cable that's actually able to last. Now, what we next consider would be when we're starting to do this reliability analysis, what are different things we're gonna have as inputs to this process? And so let's kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the parameter definitions. And we talk about failure rates uh, that are going to be given in terms of lambda. Lambda, is a, this is the Greek letter lambda. And we differentiate between what we call permanent failure rates and temporary failure rates. And so a permanent failure rate would be how many times per year would a component have a permanent short circuit that requires some type of repair? Um, sometimes this is in terms of failures per year per kilometer, if we're talking about like overhead cable or failures per year per mile, if we're talking about overhead or underground. Um, we would use a subscript P on here to note this is going to be a permanent failure rate, where if this is going to be a temporary failure, say something caused by lightning where we can clear the fault and reclose, um, that would be a temporary failure. Uh, and again, this is going to be times per year this would actually happen. And if we're talking about overhead or cable, this is usually times per year per kilometer per, per mile. We could have something fail open. They could just simply like a wire could just snap open. You know, that could be another event. And then the time it takes to fix is what we refer to as mean time to repair or MTTR. When we're talking about switching and opening and closing switches in order to restore service, um, that's going to be like a mean time to switch, uh, MTTS. And we'll see this in some of our examples later on where this is the time it takes for a crew to get out into the field, find the location and operate the correct switch. Um, if it was automated switch and this time could be pretty short, it could maybe just be on the order of a minute or so. But if it takes a crew to get out into the field, this is going to take you know, maybe like an hour. Um, we're going to have the possibility that some equipment may not work. And so if we have an automated switch, maybe the automated switch doesn't work. And so there's going to be a probability of operational failure we can consider. And then if we have scheduled maintenance, this might interfere with our response to events. And so there might be a scheduled maintenance frequency where we have to take a line out of service every so often. And there's a, like a time to maintain that which is an MTTM term. Okay, we're not gonna be in this class getting into these maintenance events, but if you were really trying to look at this for really complicated systems, this is something you might need to consider. So the failure rate is a lot of times defined by what we refer to as a bathtub curve. And usually what we would be assuming is we would be assuming that there's a break in time. And during the break in time, we first install the component, it could be more susceptible to failure because maybe there's like a manufacturing defect. And after a period of time, then this stabilizes down to kind of a flat or a constant failure rate. And this is normally what we assume in our calculations. And then when the component starts to wear out, then the failure rate starts to increase with time till eventually you, you do get the failure. So this is a bathtub curve because it's got kind of like the shape of a, of a bathtub. It's kind of a common phrase. 
Uh, and so we usually use bathtub assumptions in, in coming up with failure rates. Now, a failure rate, if you want to get into some of the math on this, we, we would actually model this as a random variable with what's called a probability distribution function. And usually we kind of assume an exponential curve in this case, but this is based on having this constant failure rate of lambda. So we're assuming we're at the bottom of the bathtub curve. And so if we have an exponential function, this lambda is a function of time, it's just a constant value. And the probability density function is going to be lambda times the exponent to the minus lambda t power. And so if we integrate this term, when the, what this gives us is this is what we call the cumulative distribution function, which gives us the probability of failure as a function of time t. And so if I integrate this curve and I get the cumulative distribution function, this is going to be 1 minus exponential to the power of minus lambda t. Now, what does this say if this is the probability of having the failure as a function of time? Well, what this says is that eventually, as time goes to infinity, as time becomes large, then basically this term keeps dropping, 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 dropping. And eventually, we're going to get a failure, right? Uh, with the failures denoted by a one. And so everything's going to fail eventually. It's just a matter of in what time frame. So we have different sort of rates we can assume for overhead versus underground um, versus transformers, whatever. And these are some tables from Richard Brown's book that I have as a reference. It's a book on electric power reliability. And what he did is he went through different references and just kind of pulled information from different references to come up with a table that could be used for reliability analysis. And so he's got this for overhead lines. He has this for transformers and switches and things like that, where basically what he found out was that for primary feeders, usually the reliability varies from 0 0.02 to 0 0.3 events um, per mile, per year per mile. Okay, so these are per mile. Where the time to repair varies between two and eight with a mean value of four. So this is kind of where I come up with a lot of these numbers from in my examples, is you know, take on the average from, from the industry literature about four hours to repair. And this numbers, these numbers um, differ depending on what sort of equipment we're talking about, but mostly in this class, we're gonna be concerned with overhead. You'll have a similar table for underground. So note that the failure rates on the low end are pretty low, right? But then on the high end, it can actually get pretty high because if you have wear and tear, these cables can actually start to um, fail quite a bit, right? And then the time to repair you'll see is a lot higher because we actually have to send a crew out there and take the bad section of the cable out and wire around it. And then finally, for substations, you know, these numbers would be really low, but the time to fix it would be really high. So if you have a problem in a substation where a substation transformer fails, it could take quite a bit of time to like get a new transformer installed, um, if that's going to be the case. Um, but, but fortunately, these substation events are, are actually pretty rare, even though the time to repair is actually going to be pretty high. All right. So, what we're going to want to do is take these numbers like lambda and mean time to switch and mean time repair and do some analytical operations on these. And what we're going to do is what's called predictive reliability analysis. What we're going to do is we're actually can predict based on these numbers what type of events I could have in a given calendar year, right? And what this is going to be used for is to try to find ways we can improve on our reliability. And so once I had a predictive way of modeling this, then if I wanted to redesign my system, I could see what impact it would have on my indices. Um, if I've got um, bottlenecks, you know, that are going to be impacting reliability, I could do some things around that. I could be looking at specific projects for, for improving reliability. And what this gives me is if I have to spend so much money 
I spend X amount of money, I could determine using the predictive reliability analysis, then what would be the expected outcome Y, right? And then I could use that for doing cost benefit analysis. And so this is actually a pretty powerful tool that a lot of utilities use in order to guide their reliability investments because there's like a thousand different projects they can have for, for improving reliability. But the question is going to be is what do you spend the money on, right? And um, again, there's a lot of value to this if, if we can analyze this just like, like doing a power flow. And so what I'll do is I'll stop this video here and when we pick up on, on the last part of the segment for part one, we'll talk specifically about what's kind of like the algorithm or the approach we're going to use for specifically doing these numbers then.